Wow, the Fed is back at it again, changing once again how they want to analyze data this morning out with yet another potential thing that the Federal Reserve wants to highlight as a priority over other issues. We're going to talk about that and those trends in this video. It's important to pay attention to this, especially on the eve of jobs data tomorrow and CPI data next week. We'll briefly touch on those. Uh, but first, as you know, this is in phase. It's up like 6.8% today. This is going to be part of our discussion. I just want to mention, I shorted this sucker right here at 9.56 this morning, made $9,500 on a 20K bet, so 50%, because I closed the sucker right here at 10.56. Those are the kind of alerts I like to send to my course members in the Stocks and Psychology of Money group. I send all my alerts, so not every trade is perfect, but we are way up today. We've got another trade going as well. I hope to close that one profitable as well. We'll see how much profit we could eke out of that. Uh, but I took a little bit of profit on this one, threw it into another place, so we'll see what happens. But here's that trade history. You can see it. Let's go. That coupon code does expire tomorrow evening. We did extend it from Easter because we were getting so many emails, but... I do have religious people in the office who don't reply to emails on a religious holiday. Makes sense. I just didn't think about that up front. <laughs> My fault. So we extended the coupon until Friday night. Anyway, so what is, did the Fed just say? Well, we just had Barkin say the same usual. Barkin comes out and says, hey, you know, we have time before cutting rates. Okay, we've heard that before. But Goolsby comes out with a new one. He shrugs off the inflation pickup of Feb and Jan and instead says that the most valuable near-term indicator now is not a deterioration in the jobs market or near-term inflation figures. It's all, It's actually just the housing market. Now, the housing market is really interesting because I warned that housing prices were going to come down. I warned this starting in Q1 2022, and that is exactly what happened. Now we have the beauty of hindsight. Uh, we have the beauty of hindsight here by being able to look and say, Hey, look at this. Here was May of 2022, uh, March, April, May. That's when we peaked out. Prices fell into the fourth quarter of 2022. Prices then rose in 2023 as the stock market recovered. And then we got another lull in Q3, Q4 of 2023. Now prices are trending up again at the beginning of the year, but we're hitting lower highs. Now, those of you who are stock traders know that this could potentially beget either a breakout to the downside or some kind of more near-term correction. And so the question is, where could this kind of uh, the correction be most pronounced? And is this potentially, that is a softening in the real estate market, is this potentially going to lead to Fed rate cuts? The Dallas Fed actually just put out a piece that suggested, hey, because of our rate hikes, we prevented housing from becoming even more overinflated, and we actually helped make housing more affordable, which is a little loony because when you look at mortgage rates at 7% today, nobody's going, oh, housing's more affordable. If anything, it's way less affordable. But the point is, they have clearly put a lid on prices with their rate action. The biggest correction was in 2022. The question is, is that just the beginning of the dip we're about to get? And so the way to really analyze this is start looking at markets that are a little potentially exposed to overbuilding. Overbuilding is a way, and this is going to blow some people's minds, but uh, I'm, I'm about to make an argument about why illegal immigration actually helps a certain amount of real estate. And, and this is like so broken. Uh, nobody should be condoning illegal immigration. And I'm not in this video. I want to be clear about this. But remember, during COVID, people moved to markets uh, in areas like Vegas, Arizona, Texas, and Florida. Okay, great. So we get a surge of population there. Those are easy places to build. So you build more homes. Okay, fantastic. So you build more homes because you have more people. You get maybe equilibrium in the market, right? Or a slight increase in prices. That's fantastic. Where are you not building more homes? Well, you're not building more homes where uh, you're not getting a surge of population. Where are you not getting a surge of population? Ah, places like California, where I predicted when I ran for governor in 2021 that because California is not building enough homes the state is actually going to get more expensive, not less expensive. Even though people are leaving the state or were leaving the state in 21, 22, because of the lack of building, we would actually see home prices go up. And that's exactly what the LA Times just put on their front page. I tweeted that here just a few days ago. So we know that's happening. Well, guess where a lot of illegal 
border crossers go to fill up more houses. They don't go to Texas or Florida. They might cross the border there, but where do they usually end up? In the liberal states. The liberal states are the ones building less housing supply. So you're actually now, instead of seeing this continuation of a COVID wave where more population is going into Florida and Texas, what you're actually seeing uh, is you're seeing states like California get more immigration again while you're kind of somewhat stalling out on 2023 population trends in states like Florida and Texas. Uh, and, and these are just the current estimates where we're not suggesting that uh, they're definitely like, oh, you're going down or or you're collapsing in uh, population. But uh, what you're seeing is a state like Texas that saw a population increase of a 5% during COVID uh, only saw a 1.6% increase in population between 22 to 23 uh, a similar story for a state uh, like uh, Florida. So Florida and Texas, you're, you know, you previously had these dramatic inflows of, uh, you know, nearly a million people going into a state uh, like Texas, uh, and that growth. Uh, back then was phenomenal. You know, you had you had excellent growth, and it really demanded more building. That's fantastic. We like more building because it makes housing more affordable. But the problem is when your population is only growing at 1%, well, but you're building substantially more homes, at some point rents are going to have to come down. Now we're still waiting for the latest numbers in California to actually show population going positive again. But as you can see here, most of the dip in California happened early in the pandemic. That's the same kind of reverse that you had in Texas and Florida, where you had most of the surge at the beginning of the pandemic. That led to an explosion of new construction. And now what you're seeing is rents substantially start to decline. In fact, when I go to Zillow.com and I look at areas in, let's say, Dallas, Texas, and I want to start finding what's available for rent, the number of properties for rent is insane. We could go to some of these areas close to hospitals north of downtown uh, Texas. And what you'll find is you'll find buildings that are trying to ask $3,700 or here's one that's asking $4,200. You're going to find these more expensive buildings. Here's an apartment building that's offering one bedrooms and studios from $1,300 to $1,369. What you're finding is a lot of these properties are now offering free applications, free fees, and up to four weeks free just to get properties rented. One of the problems is you've got so much new construction as you click around here, and they all have plenty of units available that they have to give concessions to actually get these units filled. Let me give you another example here. Here is a 16 uh, unit available building. Uh, it's called The Flats on Roseland Ave in Dallas. All of the 16 units are available here. So they've either just put these on the market or they can't rent them out. But we're looking at little one bedroom units. They're trying to get 1,900, some as low as 1,600 for all of these one bedrooms. But the reality is this is clickbait because when I go to their website, they're already offering you two bedrooms starting at $1,399. Well, that's not what they're listing here. They're not listing any two bedrooms at $1,399. Uh, uh, that's because on Zillow, they're showing these high prices to show off to potential buyers. Oh yeah, we're getting really good numbers. We're getting good cap rates. But it's all clickbait because the, the tenants and the tenant facing sites, they're offering one month free for March move-ins. And what happens is that's the offer. Then smart tenants go in and say, I need two months free and I'll sign right now. And they're getting it. So we're starting to see rents decline in these overbuilt markets. And one of the ways we could start seeing in at least the single family space that you're starting to get an increase of inventory, which puts downward pressure on price. Here's just an example on the single family space quickly. This property sold in 2020. They listed it for rent for 4,500, dropped the price to 4,200 about a month later, dropped the price to $4,000 about a month later, dropped it to 3750 about a month later. Looks like they finally got it rented the tenant probably left uh, you know sometime here in the spring or whatever because it's up for rent again they actually listed it for less than what they rented for the last time or at least were advertised for the last time still not renting dropping the price again this kind of stuff is going to keep happening why does it matter for the fed because owners equivalent rents are stagnating they're flattening they're falling this is something that is going to drive core inflation down and that favorite multivariate core inflation 
We want to see this come down. And housing is a huge component. PCE, it's about a 25% component. Part of a CPI, it's about a 34% component. So right here, we're seeing the stagnation of inflation from housing. But the actual leading rental data suggests we are going to see a very quick slowdown. Uh, maybe not necessarily quick, but we're going to see a slowdown in this housing data. This is good for a, an inflation point of view, but is it going to be offset by housing or non-housing services uh, stagnating? Possibly. But it's very interesting to see Goolsby highlight how important housing is going to be because we are seeing a slowdown in housing, especially in those overbuilt areas. Now, in my opinion, this creates fantastic opportunities for a company like Househack. My real estate startup warrants are due uh, on Monday. And of course, we have a fundraise going on that ends uh, June 30, uh, uh, 30th. So make sure you're part of the fundraisers if you're interested in getting into our real estate startup Househack. Househack.com slash 2024 to read the PPM and learn more about the investment opportunity. Uh, there's risk with every investment. Always remember that. Uh, but... What's really interesting, as somebody who's working in the housing market on a daily basis, and I'm seeing this happen, I don't think that Goolsby is wrong. The question is just, what's going to happen first? Are we going to get a bad jobs read and bad uh, uh, CPI read before we actually get that housing data showing up? And that's where I'm concerned. So... I want to be very clear, and most people know this. The people who have been following me for a while, they know I've been bullish on this market since November of 2022. Uh, I've called the Nike swoosh, the volatile Nike swoosh recovery, and it's done very, very well. Uh, and I've been bullish for the greater part of 15 months. However, for the last three and a half weeks, I've been bearish. I've been bearish because I've seen the following. I've seen BTC topping out. I've seen uh, the NASDAQ topping out. I've seen gold rocketing, which is a fear signal, oil and yields rising. And the market still thinks we're going to get a June cut. I think that's too soon. I don't think we're going to get that. And I think we're just one bad jobs and CPI report away from a major correction. I do think Goolsby is right. In the longer run, over the next year, we are going to see housing data hurt rental data. We're, see, we're going to see rental data come down, as we've just seen, especially in the overbuilt areas, that is going to be supportive of rate cuts. But I don't know if we're going to get good jobs and CPI reports before that. And that's the danger we have to be prepared for now. The danger right now is all, in my opinion, it's going to take with this fragile glass foundation that we're on is a bad jobs report potentially tomorrow morning, 5.30 a.m. If we get an average hourly earnings read, I mean, I'll read out the expectations here in just a moment. Uh, right now, the uh, average estimate is 0.3. Median estimate is 0.3. If we get 0.4 or above on those average hourly earnings, this market's going to take the giant uh, doopsies really quickly. Worse, if we get our core CPI numbers next week on Wednesday that come in, expected to come in at 0.3, Survey says average is a 0.29, median is 0.3, so people are actually leaning closer to 0.25 or 0.3. If we get a 0.4 handle on that, big poopsie doopsie. Now, if we get good reports, hey, maybe the party can keep going. Maybe everything will be fine and the party will just keep rocking on. That's great because eventually, if the party keeps rocking on, we are going to get to that better disinflationary housing data. That is happening. I'm not worried about that. That will support rate cuts that will support long-run bullishness, especially on interest rate sensitive. I'm just worried that we get a correction on some of these next data sets, then the Fed delays the June rate cut to September, and we have a three-month correction period. Now, the last time we had a three-month correction, everybody thought, oh, that's it, the Nike swoosh recovery is over. No, I just think there's going to be a better buying opportunity soon, and I think it's coming fast. So we'll see. I don't know. I'll be covering these reports live. And if all the data keeps coming in golden, no problem. I was wrong on my three weeks of bearishness. Just saying right now with the levels of greed and fear, I'm not too optimistic on that short term. And here's why. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Check out the Stocks and Site group and get my trade alerts. Bye. Why not advertise these things that you told us here? I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Paffer out there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take. 
Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, licensed real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is not personalized advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show shall not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purposes of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services we may benefit from. I also personally operate an actively managed ETF. I may personally hold or otherwise hold long or short positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuer other than HouseHack, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Make sure if you're considering investing in HouseHack to always read the PPM at HouseHack.com.